What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Shardog.com. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be joined by the head coach of the Irish Gym of the Year in 2022, John Kavanagh, before a very, very, very busy time in the world of uh, of Irish mixed martial arts uh, and SBG martial arts as well, I suppose. John, thank you very much for joining me. How are you today? It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks very much. And congratulations on you and uh, severe MMAs and, and the continued success. It's been great to watch. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. And we couldn't have done it without yourselves and, and all the, the fighters coming up. So it's been a great time for Irish MMA, I suppose, you know, with the the media have done very well along with all the fighters and everyone else so it's it's great to uh, it's great to be a part of it all and to be to be watching uh, everyone yeah. Yeah. coming up every year i think it's going to start to level out and then every year it just continues <laughs> yeah. to climb and this year is definitely going to be the biggest one yet so it's great i i was looking at the schedule for the upcoming Irish card, we have one over in Severe Men I'm sure Sh- Shardog and everyone have it i suppose but the amount of events that are coming up in Ireland is is crazy. I know we we had obviously the pandemic and we had obviously the Jar Carvalho thing where we had no events for a long time, and now it feels like I, I tweeted it the other day. It's the fight capital of Europe, and it certainly feels like that. And for you leading like the biggest gym in the country, how good must that be to have so many fights on your doorstep? Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, I think in December I saw there was an eight day period that had three MMA events on, which was which was crazy. And uh, yeah, new promotions popping up, and they're all doing very well. Um, the the scene is buzzing to say, to put it mildly. A hundred percent. Let's start with Bellator, I suppose, because that's the card coming up here very, very shortly. Um, and I suppose the Bellator card for a lot of people has been maybe a little bit underwhelming. We don't have the big James fight that we're used to. The the Peter Creedy fight is maybe a little bit even of a, of a step down compared, to, obviously, to Benson Henderson and the title fight. And we have. A very good fight in the main event, but with no Irish guys on it. When you saw the card and you saw the card kind of working out the way it was, were you just thinking of your own fighters or were you thinking of maybe the quality of the card like some of the some of the fans maybe were? Yeah, I tried to look at it from both ways. Uh, Bellator has been great for Irish MMA. Obviously, my gym has done very well. And, you know, they've committed to coming twice a year. You get the green bullet going through the city. It's becoming a, becoming a real um, Irish brand almost. Um, and I, I also respect the fact that they don't try to, how do I say, like sort of shortchange the Irish fans by just having locals on it. You know, it's great that the local Irish fans want to see all the Irish uh, fighters on it. That's fantastic. But I like the fact they bring over, you know, the old Romeros. Now we have another world title fight happening in Ireland. Um, you know, other promotions are very slow to do shows outside of the, the big old US of A. So um, I actually think it's great that uh, the Irish Bellator has, has, I think, of 13 fighters on it this time. And then, um, you know, then you have that fantastic main event. Great story behind it, that Ukrainian guy coming back from active, active duty to get us um, to go for that belt. So, yeah, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great card, top to bottom. Maybe I'm a little bit biased, but um, I hope the Irish fans uh, enjoy it too. The more I look at it and the more I break it down as we get to the, towards the card, the better it looks, <laughs> to be honest. And I think that always kind of happens. One question I want to ask you is about Carl Moore uh, and his fight against Magic uh, Rosansky, who you've coached against before, obviously, with Will Flory. I think a lot of people were a little bit disappointed in that one just because Carl had the win over Carl Brexton last fight, got into the top 10 of the rankings, and now he's fighting a guy who's only had one Bellator fight. I saw you put up a tweet about that and said there was a plan and you understand it and all. Could you just explain that a little bit, I suppose, to the people who are maybe a little bit frustrated that Carl wasn't on like the pat to the title almost after he beat a, a ranked guy? Well, he's definitely on the path to the title. Um, when I got Carl into Bellator, and because the tax man might be watching, I won't go into too much details, I got him a really good deal, a really, really good deal. And I could only get that by saying to Bellator, give me the toughest guy you have and I'll, I'll prove his worth. He did that. He went out against a ranked guy and put him away in the second round. Um, but then I wanted to slow things down a little bit, still keeping him on the very good money and uh, a, a bit more of a structured approach because in the last couple of years, he's been, um, he hasn't had a massive amount of activity. He's training very, you know, very hard in the gym. And he obviously has, he's got Big Will there. He's got uh, Johnny Walker. He's got some good guys to be on the mat with every day. But I didn't see there, there any need to be a sprint towards the belt. So this one, I understand the fancy that maybe a bit of a step down. I see it as, as a good progression fight as he makes his way. I, I'm sure a good win on this 
we'll get them ranked and then we will start that process to, process towards the belt and uh, a renegotiation as well. <laughs> How good is so it? There, uh, there, there's a bit of madness. Be- there's a bit of a, a plan behind the madness. I get you, 100%. That, that doesn't make more sense. I'm, I'm glad uh, we, we could get that uh, explanation because it, you know, I suppose there was a frustration, but that is very understandable. How good is it thought to have Carl Moore, Will Flory, Johnny Walker all there together? Because I know frustration for... The, so the lighter women and the heavier men for years has been, I can't get training partners, I can't get fights. How great is it for the three of them to have two other guys with them at the same weight class, basically around the same weight, that they can go in there and spar with and improve with all the time? That must be massive for you, considering it's so hard to find those for years. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky on both of those extremes there. I have a very skillful and experienced uh, lower female division. I think I have at any one time 10 to 12 pro and am uh, females on the mat and then for a long time my gym was kind of the the bantamweight to lightweight uh, group and that slowly expanded and maybe will and charlie ward were kind of almost on their own for a while with big guys and then when johnny came along you know still but then carl came along uh, i'll include ryan spalana that he's up quite often and we we have a steady flow of visitors as well so it's been um yeah, it's been great to see the the, the bigger guys, uh, I'll use the word expand in, in the gym in terms of bodies that they can drill and practice with, which is obviously very, very important. On women's have made in, Sinead Kavanagh, how, how is she? Obviously, the last time I saw her, she was in a wheelchair in, in the tree arena after that very bad injury in the, the epic fight, I suppose, with Leah McCourt. She's coming back against Janae Harding. Obviously, they have previous and it's going to be a rematch. How has Sinead been looking in the gym? How is she fixed for, for the, the fight upcoming? Yeah, great. She had another, uh, myself and Dave Roach, we sometimes pinch ourselves at the, at the spars we get to watch. It's, you know, they, they, they could be on the main card of any card and it's, her and Lucy, who has a, um, a UFC fight coming up in April, and uh, when the two of them spar, the gym seems to stop and watch them. It's 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 all out war, but I will say sensible war. But they really they really push each other very well. Um, knee looks hundred percent. She's doing all the movements we would want to see, and to get that rematch against a, a girl that has a win over is uh, is great. You know, and she gets to do it on home ground. So, yep, she's she's trending very well. And then. Danny McCormick is just while we're at it. Obviously, she has a massive fight coming up for the Invicta title. You know, there was a lot of talk about maybe her fighting Sean Abandon or fighting locally again or maybe fighting on to get to it. But how good is that to have a world title fight to look forward to in very quick order, I suppose, after just signing with Invicta, just having one fight and now to have that and, and the prospect. That must be exciting for you in the gym and for everyone. Yeah, it's huge. You know, we've had a couple of kind of firsts in the gym with uh, whether it's a Cage Warriors champion, a UFC champion, a Ultimate Fighter Trophy winner, um, we've been close a couple of times with the Bellator belt, not not quite yet, and then uh, and now for another hopeful, hopefully a first with Danny becoming the first Irish female to win an Invicta World Title. Um, really impressed that she went in on that last fight, great performance, and then she really kind of grabbed the bull by the horns and and demanded that title fight. And I'm always impressed when fighters take ownership of that themselves, not just you know, you you know this game, the professional game. You have to go out and perform. You have to you have to do that. But you also have to have your you know a bit of a stunt speech ready for the microphone. Uh, understand the social media game. Understand PR. Understand marketing. And that was all all Danny. Maybe a, a little bit of pushing in the background. And I just think it's come at a at a really good time. And I, I've 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 uh, brought it up a few times lately, but she is one of my favorite stories in combat sports in general. Obviously, out of my gym in particular, you know you know the story. Twenty fifteen, uh, <laughs> a girl with a couple of drinks at a party telling me what she was going to do. She go she goes and does it. Comes in, trains her ass off. Um, a real inspiration to I won't just say female MMA, but to MMA in general about how to how to conduct yourself. And uh, now we have a chance for for the Victor World title, so I'm I'm really excited about that. And she is flying in the gym at the moment. We had um, I have to train all the program in my gym. I took the session yesterday with them. That's a bunch of people doing their first lesson. And at the end of it, I told them to stay back and watch. Uh, it's about fifty or sixty people. They all got around the cage and they watched her do an incredible five round spar with two different girls, which is inspiring to them. They get to see what what's coming in the future. And for Danny, I like doing fight simulations where it's a little bit uncomfortable. 
So I had that fight feel to it with it, you know, fans in the audience shouting and, and watching her. So we, I, I really felt we made great progress during that. I think two things are very interesting with Danny as well. And I want to get your opinion on it because, okay, she was someone that came up to you know with a couple of drinks and uh, after McGregor fight, but she also had the background, you know, in horse riding and all that. She had an athletic background herself before that. But she also has, uh, you know, she's a coach herself and she coaches a lot of the young kids coming up and does a great job with that. How good is that to have someone... A, with an athletic background, but B, that focuses so much on the fundamentals all the time. I know you've said it about Brian Moore before because he has to train with it by himself so much because he's down on Wexford. But for Danny, how good is that to have those two things, both an athletic athletic base to work with, but also a, a real adherence to the fundamentals? Yeah, if you want to know, do you actually understand something, try, t- try and teach it to somebody else because that's when they ask you questions of why this and why not that. And, if you, you know, sometimes you just shrug your shoulders and you go, well, it just feels right to do it. But with Danny, she had to really kind of go back to ABCs and really understand the fundamentals of, of all the aspects of MMA because she has an absolute killer club up there, a bunch of uh, up-and-comers that are doing amazing. And, you know, she's answering questions on finishing techniques and different positions and escapes, etc. So I really forced her to make sure she not only can do it, which she can, she seems to have a bit of a natural fighting ability, but now she really understands why she's doing certain things. And um, I think that's been, it, I'd actually, for a lot of people, I'd say, maybe don't try to be a full-time coach while uh, competing in MMA. But for her, it's actually, it's been a massive positive. And she's running the Irish Youth Squad as well. She has a session on Sunday in my gym. And there's usually eight, 70, 80, 90 kids at that. And she does an, she does an amazing job of that too. It's very interesting. I'm really looking forward to, to her fight. I want to ask you about the structure of MMA, I suppose, because for a long time, MMA was, you know, the Wild West and there was no structure. But it seems, especially in Irish MMA at the moment, and with your gym, there's like the structure from the IMAFs to, you know, starting off and trying to get paid very well early and then take that on for the rest of your career whereas before it was maybe we'd have a few fights we try to win them we tried to get to the UFC and that's where we ended up getting money have you had to adjust for your mindset as a coach first of all but the fighters mindset as well to to look at MMA as more a career than just a dream I suppose to get to the UFC has that changed a lot for for you and your fighters over the years um all I see now is a lot more opportunities than there was at the start. Um, guys are getting fantastic ex- experience through the IMF pathway and the, the amateur scene in, in, in the old days was, you know, you get the odd fight on these Saturday night shows. Now they're going away. They're experiencing travel. They're experiencing working with a team. If they are doing well on a tournament away, they could get three or four fights in that one week. So the you know Kieran Clark is someone I always use as as that example of someone that really was a seasoned amateur, and when he when he came out of that amateur career, he was ready to go right into you know tough fights, and he's he's had a great streak with, with Bellator right now. So instead of uh, with all due respect to the to the amateur shows around Europe, there's a lot of Mickey Mouse fights in there, and amateurs taking them, getting a little bit carried away about winning a belt in the amateur scene doesn't really mean anything it's just experience and i there's no if, if i'm matching two amateurs and one of my guys and i see the other guy has six regional fights but he's never done an imaf tournament i know they're not going to be at a, a very high level whereas you see someone as an imaf european medalist or world medalist that's somebody that's 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 very very good i i've said it before i'll say it again that in a couple of years time i don't believe there will be any pro mma champion that's not being an IMAF champion first. Uh, Mohamed Makhiev is, is a great example of someone doing that. You know, Kieran Clark, uh, Danny McCormick, and, and so on and so on. So for me, the pathway now is, is get your experience in the IMAFs, pl- compete plenty in grappling tournaments, you know, whatever you can compete in, get that experience up so that when you go pro, you're not, you, you're not kind of wasting too much time with fighting these 0 and 18 guys on, on the UK scene and it's it's just a waste of time. You're ready to go straight straight into the, the the leagues where you're getting paid decent money right away, whether that's whether that's Bellator or PFL or, or you know sort of contender series or ultimate fighter show, something like that. So because I, I would be slow now to push someone into pro. I think MMA will become like boxing where 
you get your you, you compete mostly in amateur and mostly when you're finished amateur you just go off and get a you know we go off and get a job that's that's just the way it is for the 99.9 percent of amateur boxers amateur mma will go the same way and then for the very small percentage that are able to and are ready to be a, a real professional mma fighter that they can make good money right from the start i think it's interesting because there's like there's a small gap there that you go from the amateurs and if you've a great amateur career, someone like Bellator, as we've seen, have been signing people or PFL now as well, or Invicta or others. And the UFC or the contender series are tough, are not getting people who are O and O unless it's the very, you know, there's been a couple of exceptions, obviously. And that leads to everyone then who are very good going to PFL and going to Bellator and then kind of not being able to go to the UFC because the pay is too good there. They'd have to take a pay drop to go there. So there's less people going to the UFC all the time. And there are very few Irish fighters obviously in the UFC at the moment. Is there any way to fix that, I suppose? Is there any other route to go to get people to the UFC without going to Bellator, without going to PFL? Or is the future going to be all be a PFL and all Bellator, do you think? Um, I think there's there's a mix. It's you know most you speak to most uh, you uh, MMA fighters in their early twenties, and it's still the the three letter acronym is is really what they want on the resume. And I try to tell them that that's great if that's going to be the route for you. But remember that prize fighting is about money, and that's that's really where you should be going, where the money is. And it's great now the landscape has changed a little bit that there is other options other than just thinking must do UFC, must do UFC. And that kind of competition is only good for the fighters because, you know, when you get a monopoly, then you, you can be kind of low ball. But if there is genuinely other promotions out there with similar money, similar pathways, um, yeah, I think it's only in the fighter's favor. So I'm, I'm not obsessive about getting someone at UFC. I am obsessive about getting them well paid from the start. Obviously, like Cage Warriors used to be the route. It's the way Connor went, this is the way Neil Siri went, and Kyle Binder and all the guys to get there. And obviously, you know, your fighters haven't been in Cage Warriors for a good while, with a couple of exceptions as well. And there's a big show coming up there in Dublin. Is it a little bit bittersweet? I know there's a couple of your, uh, your fighters are not going to be in that. Maybe you won't have a main event in that. The Cage Warriors are coming there, and that kind of relationship is not there anymore. Is that a little bit bittersweet for you? And that maybe that route to the UFC isn't there anymore. And hopefully, like wh whether whichever side of the argument you fall on, maybe if they paid more, it would have been. Is, is that a little bit bittersweet for you? Uh, in the last year or two, uh, my professional fighters have made more money than in my first 15 years combined. So we're doing okay. Um, you know, Gunnar Nelson, he got to the UFC without any cage warriors fight. So I think that's a bit of a false, um, yeah, a bit of a falsehood. I, you don't have to go cage warriors to get UFC. There's plenty of promotions, you know, uh, Lucy, one of my, one of my uh, UFC fighters, she went the octagon route and the octagon, I think that's criminally under, known on the, on the European scene. If anybody's been to an Octagon show, it is crazy. Ten, plus 10,000 fans 10 times a year. It's, a, it's an amazing promotion. I really like those guys. Um, so there is other routes if, if, if you are about the UFC. I mean, I, I, I feel Lee Hammond will, will get to the UFC and he won't fight in Cage Warriors. So there is, there is other ways around that. And, you know, uh, the Cage Warriors route is is genuine. There's, there's no doubt about that. But it's it's can be quite restrictive, and it's it's such low money for so long. And you see the guys doing five round fights for a couple of hundred quid, and then coming out fairly smashed up. You've only got a few of those in the tank, and um, I, I would just like to see that they are able to get that experience if the UFC is their final destination that they are really obsessive about. But you know, make actual money on the way up there because. You fight for some of those promotions. I won't just say cage wars. There's, there's other ones out there as well that you could be doing three, four fights a year. And to be to be blunt, you'd be better stacking shells and little in, in terms of money. And you can't train full time and that unless you're very maybe very forgiving parents or you got somebody behind you that can that can support that. So um, yeah, I don't have any. I think there's a. I don't know whether it's public or it's it's unwritten but there's a ban on SBG fighters and cage warriors so I don't have anyone on that I don't see that changing anytime soon but I've got great relationships with with all the other promotions and uh, like I said whether it's Octagon I, I really like that one but 
you know, look at Lee Hammond. You, if you become undeniable and you just keep going in and, and winning, you get to the UFC if that's your goal, no matter what route you take. How good is Lee Hammond? Because I remember hearing about Lee and it's like, oh, he's this great jiu-jitsu guy. He's absolutely brilliant. He's training with Connor and all of his camps and all of that. And then we've seen him obviously in the amateurs, but then he comes out and has his first pro fight after not being around for a while. And I'm like, this guy's a striker. <laughs> What's after happening here? He just looked completely different. That's so exciting when you know a guy is a great jiu-jitsu guy and then he comes out striking like that. And he's had a few tough fights since. Where is Lee now? What's going to be the next move for Lee for you? Um, we're talking to a few promotions at the moment. I think, he, is he 5-0 and now or 6-0? and um, 5-0, I think so. So he, he is one of the guys that, that seems pretty adamant to uh, want to go the UFC route. So I guess it's to get to 10, 10 fights, 12 fights, and just become undeniable. And you keep going out there and putting on the type of wins he has. He's, I, I hesitate to use the word uh, genius. It's thrown around too much now, but he seems to have, he's almost outside the matrix in, in, in the way he moves in some ways. And his striking has become so dangerous lately. He's got a real MMA game I love to see. Very dangerous striking. And then if you take him down, you're 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 in trouble right from the start. Whether he's on his back, whether he's on top, or he's on doesn't matter where he is. There's some weird submission <laughs> coming your way that I'm scratching my head, going, "What the hell are you doing?" But um, yeah, I'm I'm very excited about Lee. I, I've not I've no doubt he'll be a world champion. I don't exactly know where when he's going to get there or where he'll end up, but he'll be a world champion. He's phenomenal. I don't think there's many more guys who'd be coaching to do Barambolos in, in MMA fights either. It's there far from me. So, uh, <laughs> Never mind once. He's gone and done it twice yeah, now. Like he has, yeah, he has. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's brilliant. Uh, last couple of questions here, John. I really appreciate it. I was going to ask you more about PFL. Maybe we can leave that to, to another time because there's going to be a lot that's of that. Really, Sean, I'm, I'm, I'm your humble servant. Sure. Okay, so let, let's do it. So, jo- Actually, just before we were recording this, it was announced that Franz Malambo has signed and I'm delighted to see Franz has signed because... To me, Franz is one of the best fighters in Ireland and he hasn't been fighting for a year and it was very, very frustrating, I suppose, for a lot of the fans in the media as well, knowing how good Franz is. Will Flory is there, Nathan Kelly is there and there's a big Irish show coming up in December as well, so there's probably going to be a good few more Irish fighters getting on that. How great is that to have another show? Not just a show, but you have a series of European fights and in a series to get a million at the end of it as well. That must be exciting for a lot of people coming up in the gym. Yeah, it's fantastic. I was very pleased to see Fran sign with them. Um, I have another girl making her debut at PFL soon. I don't know whether that's been announced yet, but so I'm I'm getting a good presence in that organization. You know, I, I think as a coach, I manage some of the guys. I try not to manage. I hate being a manager, but sometimes I end up being a manager until they get like a real one. But um, for me to have a good spread, I don't. I, I wouldn't like to just you know all the eggs in one basket kind of thing. I have a a decent presence in 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 uh, Bellator and getting that with PFL now. Um, obviously, a couple of guys in the UFC as well. So it's great to have that spread and get to see how how all they work. And for the guys coming up, I'm able to speak with experience to them about the pros and cons of of, of which organization you know you want to end up in. But again, this is only good news for Europe. I think it was ignored for a long time by, by those big shows and. PFL have made a real commitment commitment to it now with their with their league this year around Europe, um, and then obviously Bellator has, for years has been has, has had a major commitment with Europe, and uh, obviously the UFC too, uh, putting on a couple of shows. So it's 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 really good times. Is uh, is Euro Fight Series going to be making a comeback or any of the, the, <laughs> the John Gavin promotions? You have enough promotions now; you don't need it, I suppose. Do you? Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> Anytime I've run a show it was when things were, let's say, a little bit dry for my guys, and I just wanted to get them some fights. So I, I begrudgingly or slowly go to the hassle of of, of, of putting on a, a show. I think you have to have a very certain type of personality for that. And uh, I don't have that. <laughs> and, and, and a certain bank account as well, probably. And a certain uh, bank account. Yeah. Meet some very forgiving backers. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Uh, well, we're 24 minutes in and I didn't ask a question about Conor McGregor yet, so I think that's a record. But how, how, good must Bravo. It, <laughs> how good must it be to not have to answer the question, who's Conor, <laughs> who's, who's Conor fighting next? Because we have an answer now in Michael Chandler. That must be such a relief in your yes. life, is it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely... Uh, it's a bit like Groundhog Day. Every interview, and like, oh, what's Connor doing next? And who's Connor? So to to have that out there in, in the open now and working towards that is 
is uh, relieving. <laughs> I suppose the first thing, are you going to be on Tough with Connor? And obviously, we have Bellator coming up very, very soon. And I saw Dana White saying the other day that everyone is leaving next Monday to be on Tough. So yeah. is that the first question? Are you going to be a Bellator? Or are you going to be away for it? Or, or are you going to be on Tough? I suppose uh, but three questions there for you. Yeah. Uh, yes to everything. So I, I will be on tough and I will be at Bellator. <laughs> I, I, I have to figure out this cloning process in the meantime, but, um, no, I, I, it, it, it almost kind of works out well that I, I'm missing the last maybe two weeks of the Bellator camp, which will be when things start to wind down for the guys anyway, to start taper off. So I've been there for all the, you know, the full on training, the sparring, etc. I have a big team of 13 fighters on that night. And I'll miss the two weeks while, uh, while we start the filming. And then I'll fly back, do the Bellator fights, and then fly back and finish tough. And then from there, go straight to Denver for Danny's fight, and then go straight from there to Gunny's fight in London. So it's uh, a couple of busy weeks coming up. <laughs> I'll go. It's all gone. Never stop. I suppose, you know, on tough itself, is there, uh, you, you won't be able to announce anything, obviously, or anything, but is there any chance we see a couple of Irish fighters on that? Because we love watching Tough, and obviously Connor's going to be on it, so we'll watch, but we'd love to have a few Irish fighters there as well. Is there any kind of word Connor or yourself can put in, get a couple of them on uh, it? I got to plead the fifth on that one, I'm afraid. I, okay. I apologize. <laughs> That's fair enough. The NDAs are, <laughs> the NDAs are coming out. That's fair I, enough. <laughs> You've seen some pretty heavy lawyers, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not messing with them. <laughs> That's true. That's fair enough. Uh, how is Connor looking on? How is his mindset? Because the, the very interesting thing I took from, you know, when he kind of half announced it, I suppose, on Instagram, was he talked about full immersion. I need this. It's going to be a few months or, you know, over there in Las Vegas, in a gym every day, training every day. And, you know, obviously for coming off of the big injury and then coming off of having not been as active as he used to be, it must be massive for him. Is, is that something you're planning to like, not only use this as a coaching platform for all the fighters, but to get Connor back into full immersion again? Yeah, he, he's never stopped training. I, I was only out in Crumlin with him recently. He's in phenomenal shape. And there's a real excitement in him. There's a real buzz around him. And I, I'll be honest, that was part of the... I won't say worry for me, but, you know, what, what will be the level of motivation when you've achieved the, the titles, you've achieved the money, etc. But, man, I've never seen him as pumped as I've seen him recently. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited. He's excited to be back. I'm excited to have him back. It's great for, I think, Irish MMA in general. I think it's probably fair to say it's great for MMA in general. You have him back this year. Uh, always adds a, a little bit of extra buzz to the scene. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm in. I've zero uh, concerns about motivation. His the motivation is there to show everybody uh, that this is his world. This is his game. He absolutely loves. It. He's got a lot a lot going on in his life. But I can message him anytime, day or night, with a fight sequence. I go, hey, what do you think of this? And I get immediate reply because he's he's still obsessed about the sport. I haven't seen that interest uh, wane at all. Which is great, I suppose, for all these fans and for everyone to hear. And Michael Chanderdin is obviously going to be the opponent. I was doing a podcast actually just before this and we were talking about like Michael Chander's career in the UFC so far and he it felt like he decided when he signed for the UFC contract, he also decided to just have as many exciting fights as he possibly can have. Do you think that's going to carry over until Connor, or do you think it's going to change and he's going to be shooting for legs straight away? Or what, What's your sense of it? Is he going to be going out for a fight of the year or to get the win? Um, well, I think either way, Connor gets to win, <laughs> regardless of his approach. But no, I, th I think that, that that was his makeup before, you know, when he was with Bellator, that was his makeup. So I think it's in him. He, he He's big, powerful punches. He's big, powerful wrestling moves. You know, wouldn't be the slicker striker. And, and the grappling is, is kind of big double legs. It's not it's not like a Oliveira style, you know, submission game or uh, I say that the likes of Islam and sort of style clinch game. It's 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 sort of he's very effective with it, but it's kind of brute force and a lot of energy, a lot of power. And actually, I I think it could it could resemble a little bit the Mendes fight. Uh, yeah, Mendes was that style, blocky guy, big punches, big double legs. Um, so I think I think that's how it could go. And uh, Connor has a has a good record against. Uh, those kind of orthodox stocky wrestlers with, with big overhand rights and big double legs. So um, it's an exciting one to prepare for. 
Chandler is um, he's, he's an excellent fighter. He's got a great resume. And uh, yeah, I suppose we'll have a couple of weeks of, of being around each other and, and coaching against each other. And I'm sure there'll be some uh, funny interactions with how all that goes dur during that. And then we'll have to build up to the fight. So it's, yeah, th this year is going to be a big one for sure. Indeed. That's a good way to end it. John, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, best of luck for, for the whole year and, and all the fights coming up. Thank you very much, Sean. Take care.